somebody that you know. And, and see, here's what I want you to do. I really want you to pray about God, who could you lead me to to present this little treat bag to? Who would this be a blessing to? Uh, inside, there's lots of fruit, there's candy, there's chewing gum, there's um, candy canes, there's crackers, there's a lot of stuff in there. And there's also this, and I think this is cool. 
It is an information sheet about our church. And it says, Community Church of Mount Pleasant, join us on Sundays to start the week off right. It tells us about uh, our facility here. And then it says, we're holding worship in the near future at Tuscarora Mill facility very soon. So stay tuned. It has our Facebook page and also information on the back with, about all our different ministries. So that's a big part of this as well. So take a bag for you and your family and take some extras and strategically plan about who you're going to give your bag to. Okay? I got to tell y'all, yesterday when we were doing these bags, uh, in, in the mail, in the conference room, listen, I don't know how many people you can get in that room, but we had about, we maxed out. And it was like, listen, Santa's workshop had nothing on us. It was loud. It was, there was an assembly line around the table. And people were throwing in candy and fruit, and they were laughing at each other. And Austin's uh, hat was flopping on Penny and his ears and, and Frank and they were all fussing across the table and yelling and, and, then, and then Bryson's at the end throwing in cards and everything making sure everything got it was a beautiful thing it was really really kind of what our church is all about and so thank you for those who came out yesterday and helped us serve it, it was pretty awesome um, alright let's see I have one of my heroes is here today and I love it when she comes uh, let's see going to go with, let's go with Arn, Mark. Amen. Is that okay if we go with Arn? <laughs> Alright. Uh, Ellen. Where's Ellen? There's my friend Ellen. We have a hero among us. And I'm not sure if most of you know what she's been doing these last few weeks, but I want her to give us an update on what God has been doing in, for, and through her these last few weeks. So on September 26th, through a series of interesting events, I felt led to volunteer for hurricane relief in New Bern. Um, I arrived on September 26th just to pick up trash or go get a tool for somebody because I know nothing about these things. Just do whatever they tell me to do. I'll be a warm body. <clears throat> and on Saturday, I was asked to coordinate the site. Um, so that means that I have been going to uh, into the community, meeting people, telling them what um, what kind of disaster relief we have to offer them, finding out what their needs are, writing it up, and praying with them. And that's really one of the main highlights of it is the prayer with them. The Lord is just um, I, that's where His presence comes really strong into the encounter and he's been doing things that I've never experienced before, filling my mind with scripture to break. Promises to claim, guidance, wisdom, understanding, uh, encouragement, hope, all of that's just, it's like his words are just coming out because it's, it's from the Bible. It is just one, just scripture after scripture. Um, I know nothing about construction, and well, I, I know a little bit now, but not much. I've learned a lot, and um, I'm not, uh, I don't have the spiritual gift of administration, um, so I'm in a lot of ways the most unlikely person to be doing this, but that's how God works. He often picks the most unlikely person so that he gets the credit. Um, the, other, the other highlight, besides those prayer times, is the opportunities that I have to meet people of all different ethnicities and denominations that God is trying to pull together. And over and over repeatedly, all of the people that I talk to, whether they be people who are flooded out of their homes, or whether they be pastors, or whether they be volunteers that come from other parts of the country, the thing that I hear over and over, that they're sensing God's purpose of bringing us together across ethnicity, across uh, denomination, that's a biggie, uh, across um, all sorts of barriers, he's bringing people together. Um, when I went down there, the main thing that we were doing, uh, when I, my coordinating, I get contacts from people who want to volunteer. I'm working under Presbyterian Church of America, which I've never been a member of. It's really another interesting thing how that happened. And... <laughs> 
to go up and introduce myself. Hello, I'm Ellen McLaughlin with Presbyterian Church of America. Okay, I mean, I'm not getting paid by them. I'm not a member of it, but <laughs> I'm serving under them. Uh, and the church that we're, we're working out of is Village Chapel Presbyterian. Um, so I get contacts that come through our organization that are and dates of when they want to come. Then I interact with them about what jobs need to be doing, what tools to bring, what, what the food arrangements and the sleeping arrangements. Um, <clears throat> then, um, then I help them to introduce them to the homeowner, show them the job, give them a written out list of things that need to be done at that site. Um, in the beginning, it was mostly tearing out wet drywall and insulation and spraying for mold. Um, most of that, is, we thought, was done. I got a call this week. In some ways, it was a very discouraging and burdening call because so uh, the people are starting to get back word from FEMA. They're getting like a drop in a bucket of the amount of money that they need to repair their homes. But if they get enough to buy materials, we can supply volunteer labor. We thought we had all, pretty much all the drywall and wet moldy stuff pulled out and we were in the rebuilding phase. And these calls I'm getting when people start turning on their heat, they were kind of in denial about their damage, a lot of them. And, and the lady I talked to said that now the trash is all piled up on the curb again, like they've been, it's like they're in the tear out phase again, piling trash on the curb. Um, but after the tear out phase, most of the volunteer organizations have gone other places. Uh, <clears throat> most of the organizations, the quick response ones, are, are focused on tearing out and preventing the mold from growing. But then, then comes the rebuilding phase, installing the drywall. And that's where our group comes in. There are still some groups doing that. Um, we had no volunteers from Thanksgiving to Christmas, but we have a, a huge number coming in after. Um, the needs are so great, so the prayer would be to supply the volunteers and to um, to give the Holy Spirit to help everything to run smoothly. Because when you're working with that many people, the volunteers, and you don't even know what you're doing, <laughs> you know, don't know hardly anything about construction. Uh, you, I really have to rely on the Lord. So, but that's why He wants to get the credit. So I'll stop there. Now, you you left when? I left September 26. You know, I know a lot of you have been aware of the, the storm relief and sent money and help and things. This one left her home to go there and is living there with those people. And you're going back? I'm living in my camper in the church parking lot. So, that's probably what Jesus would do. And so, I wanted you to hear this story. And I know I'm not asking all of us to go. I'm not asking us all to do that. But I want you to be encouraged and be inspired. And I want it also for us as a church. I have a, a little card here and I have a gift, a financial gift in this for Ellen. Because the, at the core of our ministry is missions. You know that. You've been here from the beginning. And there's no greater mission than to do this. You don't have to go to Africa or fill in the blank. And I want Ellen to know that her church appreciates what she does. So Ellen, thank you. Alright, there are heroes all among us. We are not naive. We are alert to that. Um, Several things that I want, I want you to be sure and keep, now, keep your bulletin and, and keep, be aware of the colored page. That's the fun one with all the pictures. That's my favorite. There's some things today that I need to highlight and I know I'm going to be quick. Um, we have something going on today that I'm very excited about for our children. It is called the CCMP Christmas Store. You saw it as you walked in. And let me explain. Our senior adult ministry, the classics, the CCMP classics, they are very classy. Uh, they have come up with this idea. Let's bring presents for our children to give to their parents and caretakers. And they're free. So our, our classics have brought, got together all of these gifts and prepared them. So when your kids go to their classes, they get to go to the store. 
And they get to get a gift for their moms and dads. And they get to take it to them. So moms and dads, take your gifts home, put it under your tree or whatever, and act really surprised and excited. Um, because this is a gift that has been prepared for our kids to have. And here's, here's what we want them to understand. Two lessons. Never miss an opportunity to teach. Giving is more important than receiving. Now that's counterculture to the world we live in today. Because our world says, here, get it. Get, 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 get. Give me more. You open one, you can't be finished, you grab your next one. That's an important lesson I want our kids to learn. And the second one is this. The greatest gifts in life are free. These kids don't have to pay any money for these presents. They're free. There are things in life that are free, that are more valuable than the, the most expensive gift you're going to buy this year. Like love, acceptance, God's grace is free. So that's what we want our kids to learn today. So classics, thank you for that. That will happen today. Tonight is our CCMP Christmas party. Not just any Christmas party. The old-fashioned Christmas party. I just want you to come. I don't have time. You're not going to believe the decorations. <laughs> Bring your cameras or your phones and be ready to take pictures. Dress festive. The second floor of 73 in Maine, which is right here in town. Everyone is invited. 6 o'clock. It's not a meal, but there will be lots to eat. So I just am very excited about the party tonight. It's going to be a great time. All right? A lot of really neat things going on. Now, the next thing I get to do is one of my favorites. Okay, Patsy and Carmen, come on up. We have, our family is growing and it grows weekly. And I know some of you are standing a lot around the walls. I apologize. Let me be through in a minute and take a break and we'll be able to get you a seat. But our family is growing and it has not stopped growing since we started in the barn. Carmen and Patsy Augusta, these guys live in uh, Huntersville. And they've been coming, I've known you guys for a long time, and they've been coming for a while, and uh, they love it, and they've been praying, and today they have decided to come and become publicly, and make it official, a part of our church family. So would you help me welcome Carmen? God, you have brought them home. And today, they're just going to make that public. And Lord, thank you for the gift that they are to us. Thank you for their faithfulness already. I pray that this church family would be a home, would be a blessing and an encouragement to them. And I know they'll be a blessing to us. God, continue to build your church and you add just the right pieces. Lord, we thank you for these people. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to take a break. What we're going to do is, all the kids can go to their classes. If you don't know where to go, just go back and somebody will be in their classes. There will be a short break. And listen, we got great worship today. Don't go anywhere.
you're new with us, if you're visiting with us, um, this is just a time when we come together to bring things as a family to the Lord. And sometimes people bring them to the Lord where they're sitting or where they're standing. Sometimes people come down to the altar on their knees and they can't get on their knees on this hard floor with those chairs down here. If you want to come and pray by yourself or with others, you come as the Lord leads you. Knowing that there's something about bringing things to the Lord together that just makes a difference for us. I was working uh, was on the ambulance this Tuesday night and uh, and everybody hears about the drug problem and the overdose issues and all the heroin on the news. It's not a news story, but we ran a call and it was, I can't describe all the situations of it, but it, Two kids went home with other people and parents went to jail that night. That's how bad it was. And you, and you drive away from that and they're, they're angry. Police officers there, there's angry firemen there, there's angry everybody there because they've just seen it over and over and over. And if you're not careful, you walk away from life events like that. And the part we're talking after we left, you will walk away and you will think that there is no hope. You can lose a lot of things, but if you lose hope, you've lost everything at some level. We walked away, drove away from that, thinking and knowing that regardless of the hopelessness that some people may have seen in that circumstance, that there was not hopelessness. That's, that, that's, the, that's the word of the Lord that can speak over any situation. And that mom and dad laying there on the floor is no more helpless than we were in our own sin. And their salvation and their rescue is no harder for Jesus than ours was. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's what? There's freedom. So there's freedom from everything this morning, folks. There's freedom from any burden you brought in today. Um, and there's the joy this morning in prayer, giving back to the Lord the gratitude for the things that He has done for us. So if you come this morning with this overwhelming gratitude in your heart, I'm going to take this time to give it back to you. If you come this morning with a seemingly hopeless problem, know that where Christ is, there is never no hope. Because He still is able to reach down into the hearts and lives of people today, just like He did 2,000 years ago. No one is beyond the love of Christ. Amen. And the power of So let's pray this morning, folks. God, we come to you this morning. We say thank you, Lord. We say that, that you have given us everything, Lord. And regardless of our circumstances, Lord Jesus, without you we have no hope, Lord. But in you we have every hope. And we have every blessing. And we have every, every reward ahead of us, God. And as believers, Lord Jesus, there is everything to look forward to and nothing to look back to, Lord Jesus. The best days are always in front of us, Lord. But God, we know not everybody comes in with a hopeless one, Lord Jesus. They come in with struggle and frustration, if not in their own lives, but from worries and cares of people around them, with their family, Lord. And the struggles they're going through are just not knowing you, Lord Jesus. And we bring that to you this morning as well, Lord. We bring you, God, the gratitude and praise that you deserve, Lord things you've done for us, God, but we also bring to you things that are beyond our control, beyond our ability, Lord, to intervene, but they are not beyond your power to act and to save and to move and to reclaim, Lord Jesus. That which seems to have been lost, but in you nothing is lost. Nothing and no one is without hope. So, Lord, help us, God, not to give up in our prayer, Lord Jesus, and not to pray from hopelessness, Lord, but to pray in hopefulness, Lord, knowing that you are able to move and to act, Lord Jesus, and you step into our lives even now, and you work and you move. And I dare say that we probably only see a small shadow and recognize a small shadow of everything that you do for us, Lord. How you have spared each of us and you have saved us, God. We love you, Lord, and help us, God, to love you more. 
you deserve it all, Lord. <coughs> you love us, you take us, you receive us, you came to us, you lived like us, you endured the pain, you took on the cross, and in that is our victory. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
to talk to you today about a very special gift. I have a gift here uh, that I'll talk about shortly. Um, but I have another gift that I want to share with you. And there's a young fellow in our church, his name is Jackson. And Jackson just was, uh, we, we've been praying about this. I want to make sure I get this right, Jackson. Where is Jackson? Come here, buddy. We celebrate things here. I hope y'all don't mind. Uh, we celebrate things when our family wins. So, my friend Jackson, also known as Hugh Jackman, uh, he tried out for this very, uh, you know, prestigious position, and it is the principal first chair. Wait, I don't know if he tried out for the first chair, but anyway. He is now the principal first chair symphonic band, UNC Charlotte Youth Wind Ensemble. Thank you, Jackson. Congratulations, buddy. I know that was a pretty big deal. See, now I officially can can uh, can talk to people say, have y'all seen pictures of my grandbaby? <laughs> I can say that now because I'm proud and I have a grandbaby. And so I say that about my church family. And so Jackson, we're really proud of you. It's great to have our uh, college kids home. Most of them are home. Um, I'm glad to, that Malin made it back. I want you to hear more later about her uh, trip. She was at, at Nicaragua this week with our partner, Farrell, and the, the Hope Project. And she was there all week working and serving. And she's her, she's over, she's filled after you've gone on an experience like that. So we'll let you hear more about her trip, but I'm glad you made it back. Got back when? At 12 a.m. this morning, so we're, we're glad she's back. And thank you for serving. Thank you for giving. That was a gift for you to do that. I want, I want to talk to you today about a, a special gift. Remember a couple weeks ago, uh, I kind of started as trying to get us in the Christmas mood, in the Christmas spirit, by talking about a very special birthday. And we, we examined that birthday. And today, I want to give you my last Christmas message before Christmas and this, this message today is called A Very Special Gift. And so, we, I wonder, how many of you are, have completed your Christmas shopping? You're finished. <laughs> Miss Whitaker is finished. Of course. Thank you, Miss Whitaker, for being so diligent. Uh, and even more embarrassing, how many of you have not started yet? I see those hands, and the altar is open for those of you who are convicted greatly about that. But uh, I hope you've been working on your Christmas presents. And uh, for those of you, bah humbug scrooges, oh, I won't do present. Well, just get over yourself. We get present here. So um, I want to talk to you today about a really special gift. And I want you to open your Bibles to the Book of Luke, chapter one. This is this is a uh, you really. You could quote this with me. You don't necessarily have to have your Bibles, but I like you to, to read it with me so you know that I'm reading you know, the truth, so I'm not making something up so you'll know for sure. But Luke chapter 1 tells us about this, this, this gift. So I want to read this passage, and then I want to, to spend a little time recounting, uh, revisiting the story, the Christmas story. I know you're kind of inundated with that, but I want us to look in, the, in, the, in this story from the Scriptures briefly today, and then... We'll, we'll make a couple of observations and then we'll be finished. Now, next Sunday, this is your chance, and I want to go ahead and announce it, make sure everybody understands. I will not be preaching next Sunday. So, you know, you have this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you have a chance to come to church and not hear me preach. We will have our Christmas production next Sunday, right here. Regular time, regular church, it'll just be a, a very special presentation for you next Sunday, all Christmas Eve. And so uh, that will be one week from today. And then the 30th, we're going to do kind of a farewell 2018 service for our Sunday morning service. And we will reflect and, and look back a little bit about all the things that God has done. Don't miss tonight. Tonight's going to be our Christmas party. Man, we're going to have a big time. We're going to celebrate tonight. At 73 in Maine upstairs. Luke chapter 1. Let me read from, let's start with verse 26. 
and then we'll read through verse 38, and then uh, take a look at some thoughts from this amazing, incredible story. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin, a spouse, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, verse 29, she was troubled at his, at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. We're getting some real good King James words there, so I'm going to kind of translate that for you in a little bit. Uh, what, what, what does this message mean? Verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? Seeing that I know not a man. I'm a virgin. I, I, how can I be pregnant when I'm a virgin? And the angel, verse 35, answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The Son of God. God's Son. And behold, your cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Well, that's don't miss that that little verse tucked away there. Verse 38. And Mary said, and this is real important. Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. That's the story of this very special gift. Now, let's, let's go back. And let's, let's talk about this story for a little bit. So if you have your bulletin and want to follow, there's a little bit of an outline there. You can, you can uh, maybe jot down some notes or just follow along. Um, or you can doodle to keep from falling asleep. It doesn't matter. The, the point number one there is, is the story. Let's talk about the story of the gift. The story is about this baby that was about to be born. For many years, God had promised that He would send His Son to be a Savior. His son would take away people's sins. The people had waited a long time. Then one day God sent the angel Gabriel to give Mary some exciting news. Mary was by herself when the angel Gabriel, God's messenger, came to speak with her, to talk to her. The angel visited Mary. Gabriel's message from God. Greetings, Mary. Now, I, I often try to put myself back in, in that scenario. I mean, think about it. There you are. You're married. You're alone. And this angel appears. <coughs> wow. Okay. Greetings, Mary. God has chosen you for a very special assignment. How must Mary have felt? Well, in, in a word, how must Mary have felt? Honor? What else? Overwhelmed, bewildered, scared, fear. I mean, here first an angel, which doesn't happen every day, and he shows up and says, "Hello, Mary, you precious little teenage girl. God has a special assignment for you." Oh, really? How must she have felt? I, I think probably, I think fear. Must, must have been an overwhelming emotion that she felt. I, I don't know. I, I'm just trying to, to put myself in that scenario. I think that's why in the passage, in the context, the angels said quickly to Mary, Fear not. It's okay. You don't have to be afraid of me. 
part of this message. Sometimes perhaps you are in a scenario that is uncomfortable to you. Perhaps fear overwhelms you and it comes out of nowhere. And perhaps it's anxiety. And perhaps you, you feel you are not equipped to handle what's going on in your life. And then perhaps the Holy Spirit of God may say to you, it's okay. Fear not. Because this is a message of God to you, Mary. So don't worry. In fact, he further goes on to explain to Mary that God is pleased with you, Mary. Wow. How must that have felt? Because so many times, me and, and us, we probably feel feelings of inadequacies and, and insecurities and failures. Like, I just feel so... I'm just such a failure. I just... I can't do anything right and I'm so just depressed and I just feel like giving up. No. The message from God is don't fear. In fact, God has found favor with you. So well, I'm not married. No. But you have the capacity to be God's child. And God is clear. God isn't angry with you. God is in love with you. Mary, God is pleased with you. Here's a message of comfort and reassurance mm -hmm. to this probably trembling teenage girl. You're going to have a son. Oh, great. It's worse. I wonder if that's what she was expecting to hear. And you're going to name him He will be the Son of God. One day He will rule over all Israel. And His kingdom will never end. I, I don't know that she had the capacity to even comprehend these words. <coughs> these prophetic words. Mary said and thought, Really? How can this be? I'm not married. I've not been with a man. I'm a virgin. God will give you this baby. Your son will be called the Son of God because God is His Father. Wow. Okay, Gabriel. I have no idea what this means. But I will do whatever God wants me to do. Can, can you grasp the submission, the compliant spirit of this little handmaiden? And she's taking in all this news and she's like, Wow, okay, God. Uh, your will. Mary was engaged to Joseph. One night in a dream, Gabriel came to Joseph. And this was necessary. And the angel had to explain this whole process to Joseph. And, and the angel said, Joseph, I know this is a lot, but it's okay. I want you to go ahead and marry. Follow through with your commitment, your vow to Mary. Even though she's going to be pregnant and you're not going to be the father, Go ahead and marry her. And you take care of her. Because this is God's plan. Wow. They both obey. Proceed with the plans you have made. Then Joseph and Mary had to take a trip. As we move along, as we move forward in the story. The ruler of all the land was Caesar Augustus. You perhaps have heard of him. He sent out a decree that is famous. You read that in Luke chapter 2. The decree from Caesar Augustus that all the people should be... See, don't be thinking you're the only one that ever has to pay taxes. This has been on a long time. 
The IRS has been around, I don't know about that. Taxes have been around a long time. So, he said, now I want everybody, we're going to have a census so that we know who all to expect taxes from. And so I need everybody to go back to your hometowns. Wow, okay. So, and, and this wasn't optional. So Mary and Joseph had a long trip ahead of them. Everyone was to go to their town of birth to be counted and, and to be uh, con included in the census and to be taxed. They had come from the town of Bethlehem. So they set out for the long trip to Bethlehem. This is, this, this, remember, didn't jump on a plane, didn't hop in their <coughs> minivan or their motorcycle. Uh, donkey ride, probably. Long ride. Great difficulty. You know, there's so much wonderful symbolism in the Scriptures. When you decide to follow Christ, you set out on this amazing journey. You don't know what's ahead of you. But your, your faith is in Christ and you say, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. You're, you're my Savior and I'm going to follow you. And the journey can get very difficult. It can get dark and scary and lonely and hard. Life is hard sometimes. And it was hard for Mary and Joseph to go on this long journey while she was with child. So they finally complete their journey. They arrive in Bethlehem. Now think about it. They've been on this long journey and she's pregnant and they're hot and tired and it's difficult and lonely and they get, there it is. There's the, there's the town ahead of us. Whew, thank the Lord. Woo! I can't wait to get me a good old Holiday Inn Express and get in there and get in turn it and get me a snack and maybe order room service and get me a nice warm bed and rest. And you know that didn't happen didn't work out that way for Joseph and Mary. Because a lot of other people were on this journey to Bethlehem too. And all the hotels and motels and uh, wherever people stayed were filled. In fact, we read there was no room for this tired, young, scared, How relieved they must have felt now that they saw the lights of their destination. And then they got there to find the place was overcrowded. It was bustling with people. No place available for them to stay. The signs were out. No room. No vacancy. I guess. What an omen. Because thousands of years later, when Jesus comes and knocks on folks the heart of folks' doors, there's no room. Jesus, we're really busy. We have a lot going on. Maybe when I get older, I'll find a room for you. But not now. No room. No place for the Savior. Finally, the only place they could find it, and they went through a long process of searching, was a place for, listen, a place for travelers' animals. A stable. In the back of an inn. Perhaps a cave. A place for animals. Certainly not a place for a camp. And that's where they stayed that night. And then the miracle. The miracle of birth. We have babies in the room now. I went to visit little Emery back there. When she was born, I love one of the things about being a, a pastor is I get to go visit folks and they have, have little babies. I get, and I've been in many, 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 many scenarios. And I love holding the little babies and I've been in that so many times and I am never, I can't, I will never, ever get used to the miracle of birth. 
I don't understand this. This human being, him being a mother for months, a living person, and then the miracle of birth. That miracle happened this night. In a place prepared for animals. <clears throat> Not a king. Darby said this. He began in a manger and he ended on a cross. And along the way had not where to lay his head. That's Jesus. The wonder of it all. At just the perfect moment the miracle happened. In a stable, a baby boy was born. It was Jesus. The Savior. Jesus, God the Son, was born just as we were told He would be. Mary wrapped Him in swaddling clothes. Cloths, rags, probably used for cleaning animals, wiping them down in the stable. And laid Him in a manger. A feeding trough. Swapping clothes or for wrapping infants in narrow bands of cloth to restrain the baby's movements. It was like putting them in a little mummy. You wrapped them up because remember they've been nine months in this confined area and they were comfortable with that. So the baby came and, and, and she found these cloths and she wrapped him up and he was all cozy in this little mummy. Waddling clothes. Kept him warm. This tradition fell out of favor along the lines of the 17th century. So this is why this whole term is waddling clothes. Although you still see little babies wrapped up like that. <laughs> Number two. The shepherds enter the story. The shepherds see the Savior. Shepherds are frightened. Why? Not far outside of Bethlehem, some shepherds were watching over their flocks of sheep. It was night. It was dark. Suddenly, a bright light appeared. In the light, there was an angel. And the shepherds were like, uh, hey, uh, see that? <laughs> I've never seen anything like that before, have you? Oh, I've never seen anything like that. Somebody been messing with your eggnog, I think. <laughs> that wasn't in the story. I probably don't need to be adding things, but it was an amazing thing for these shepherds. This experience, they never experienced this before. The angel tells of Jesus' birth. The angel spoke to the shepherds, and he said several things. First of all, again, don't be afraid, guys. I bring you wonderful news. Today, in Bethlehem, a Savior is born. He is the Son that God promised. You can find Him wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger in this town. Suddenly, many angels were around the shepherds, and the angels were singing and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Goodwill toward men. Not your average night for the shepherds. Something different about this night. The shepherds quickly went to Bethlehem to find this baby. They knew He was the Savior because of the angel's message and His explanation and all that had happened on that special night. They were so excited to... Watch this. Don't miss this. They were so excited they could not keep this news to themselves. Now think about that. It don't take much for some of you to get on the phone. Oh, uh, did you see? Have you heard? Oh, i got to tell you. These guys, what they had just seen they could not hold it in. They could not. How are you with this news of the 
Savior. You share other stuff that you get excited about. Man, did you see the Tar Heels last night? Woo! Boy, they look good. Yeah, they did. So we want to talk about it. About the Savior that was born that night to save the world. They could not contain their excitement. Listen, I hope y'all don't mind when we worship. I hope y'all don't mind that, you know, we get a little bit with it sometimes. In fact, I'd like for you to get a little bit of that on you. It's okay to get a little bit excited about the message that the Savior has come and we're here to worship Him. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> the shepherds went back to their sheep, but they could not forget what had happened. This was an experience they could not forget. They praised God. And they thanked God for all that He had done and all they had experienced that night. When we celebrate Christmas, we're doing what the shepherds did. Listen, Christmas, don't get out, out of, all bent out of shape. This isn't original. The shepherds had Christmas. And we're about to see the wise men had Christmas. And they got excited. And they thank God. We're doing as the shepherds did. We can't help but tell others the good news. That's what we're going to do next Sunday. When we sing songs about Jesus. When we do programs about Jesus and the baby in a manger. We tell the good news of the Savior that came to save us all. Number three, we close with this one. The wise men. So we see the story. Mary and Joseph. They make their trip. The miracle of birth happens. The shepherds come. And now the wise men. Time passes. Far away from the land where Jesus was born lived wise men. These men had spent a great deal of time studying God's Word. And they believed He would send a Savior. These were men that had authority and had studied and prepared and knew about prophecies about things that God had foretold. And they were actually looking for this event to happen. They were called wise men. The irony? It is indeed a wise man who studies and devotes themselves to seeking God. That is a wise man. You don't have to have a, a, a funky looking hat or a big old robe to be a wise man or a wise woman today. You seek truth. You study. You read. You, you devote your mind to following truth. And we will be a wise person as these men were. One night these men saw a bright new star. A new star. They studied the stars. Something they had never seen before. Look! It's Messiah's star. Let's go find Him and worship Him. They hurried and made ready for the trip. They packed food and clothes. And they packed something else. They brought gifts. See, these men were of means. Probably wealthy. Had a great deal of influence and leadership. They wanted to give gifts to this little baby because they knew who he was. As they traveled, probably rode on camels in groups with entourages and finally arrived in the land of Israel. They got to Jerusalem and began to ask, Where is he? Where is the one? Where's the one who is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and we've come from afar to visit. The king heard it. His name was Herod. Everyone is not friends of Jesus. Herod was not. Herod was the king. He lived in a palace in Jerusalem. He heard of their inquiries and he was upset because he was jealous because 
This king did not want to share his throne with another king. With any king. He was jealous. And he liked his power and his authority. And he was not happy about the news of another king. <laughs> he was very insecure. He wanted to be the only king. Herod called his leaders and asked, Where is this boy? Do y'all know about this? I gotta, I gotta find out about this little. I gotta do something about this. This is a threat. Herod spoke to the wise men and he said, Oh, wonderful to have you. You go find him and tell me so I too can come and worship him. No. He didn't want to worship him. There are those today who don't want to worship him. As the wise men went to Bethlehem, the star appeared again. This time it led them right to the house in Bethlehem where Joseph and Mary and the young child Jesus lived. When the wise men went into the house and they saw Jesus, they knew. They knew. They knew that they had found the one that God had sent. Another wonderful lesson for us. Guess what they did when they saw Him? These were men of great wealth, of great people. You know what they did when they saw Jesus? Yeah. And they worshipped the King because they knew who He was. And one day, we are told every knee will bow to this king because his kingdom has no end. Can I encourage you? Don't wait until that day when you will be forced to bow. You can bow now to this king. He's the Son of God. Then they brought out their gifts. I find it amazing. They did two things. They worshipped. They worshipped. They worshipped. And they gave gifts to the king. What can I give Jesus? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Don't go buy Jesus something at the mall. He, he, he made the mall. He don't need the mall. Guess what he wants for Christmas? So, you don't have to spend money. They worshiped him and they gave gifts. They brought gifts that were lavish gifts. Gold, frankincense, myrrh, gifts of great value because they wanted to give Him their best. Don't listen. Don't re-give Jesus. Don't give Jesus your leftovers. Give Him your best. Your best. Well, Lord, you know it's been a busy week. Christmas, I'm busy, I've been working a lot. If I get up and feel like it, and if we have, I'll try to get over there and worship you. Before they left, God warned them in a dream. Guys, don't go talk to Herod. Don't go back to Herod because Herod has ill plans for this baby. They obeyed and God the Father kept His Son safe from the King. When we give gifts at Christmas, we are showing love and respect for each other. We're being like the wise men who showed love and respect for this baby king by giving him gifts. Let me finish with an application. I'm done. Thank you for your patience as we have revisited the story that you're so familiar with. Now, 
Two other verses I want you to think about. This very special gift. Let me take you to a verse that perhaps you know as we close. John 3.16. Anybody know that verse? Did you know that that verse is about Christmas? For God so loved the world that He There it is. God started Christmas. God gave the greatest gift ever. It was His most valuable possession. He didn't get it from the mall. He gave His Son. His only Son. So that whoever trusts and believes and places their faith and their life in His hands. Would not die, but would live forever. God started Christmas. He loved. He gave. Don't, don't you dare. Oh, we don't have, you don't have to do all this. For... He loved. And out of that love, He gave. When you love, you give. Husbands, when you love your wives, you give. Well, I guess I better. I put my duty. I guess I'm. <laughs> when you love. the most natural progression. When you love, you give. That's God. True love leads to give. When you love God, you give. Second verse is 2 Corinthians 9, verse 15. This is, uh, perhaps you know this, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's, a, it's another Christmas verse. It's a short one. You'll like this one. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. God loved you so much that He gave. What did He give you? Jesus. Salvation, <coughs> grace, love, forgiveness, acceptance, all wrapped up in one present, and His name is Jesus. All of that, everything you will ever need is wrapped up in that one present. His name is Jesus. Everything. Well, I hope you get what I want this year. Well, I've been wanting... Paul said, unspeakable. That word could be better interpreted. Indescribable gift. There are no words. To explain and describe the gift of Jesus. This verse seems almost out of context. <clears throat> Paul simply... <laughs> I, I looked at this and I thought, well, i got to see where... What is this? Where does this come from? It seems to us that as the Apostle Paul reaches the end of this section on giving, he's talking about Christian giving. He is forced to think of the greatest giver of all, God Himself. And he thinks too of the greatest gift of all. And Paul simply bursts into explanation. And this verse comes out. And he says, thank God for your indescribable gift. Jesus. That's the context. Paul 
Paul just burst out. He couldn't hold it in. Thank you. And so he would leave the Corinthian brothers on this high note. I want you to remember two things as we leave. We see in these verses and in this passage and on this Christmas the greatest giver of all is not Santa Claus. It's God. The greatest giver of all. And second, the greatest gift of all. Today, I have a gift. I prepared this gift. I wrote this gift. I know it is not, if you were to grade it, it probably wouldn't be an A plus, but it has snowmen on it. <coughs> um, I wrap the presents at our house. Sorry, man. Lose my man card. I have a, a Christmas workshop upstairs in our family room. I like the red friends. So <laughs> and I want to give you an example today of a gift. I wrap this for y'all today. And I'm going to unwrap it for you today, right now. Because I want you to see what's in it. Gift for you. Y'all like to unwrap presents? I'm so bad. I get gift boxes and I wrap them. I meet up with it. A cat knows. You've been watching, I know what you've been watching. Right. You gotta have a little suspense. You can't make it easy. <laughs> this is a cross. It was a gift to me. Uh, not just any cross. Inside this cross is a picture of the nativity. A picture of a donkey and a sheep and a stable and a manger and a mama and a daddy and a baby. And it says, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth, what's the next word? Receive her king. Now here's the thing about presents. I could have just walked around with the box. Look at my present. Y'all like my present? It's a nice present. It's my present. What's in it? I don't know. But it's my present. There are people today, probably in this building, and you've heard of Jesus. You know about Jesus. but you never really received Jesus. You opened up the wrappings and the presents. That is Jesus. And see, there are people that they know that present is there, that gift, that gift of forgiveness, salvation, and grace. And it's there. But until you take it, and open it and receive it. It is not really yours. But now I've opened the present. And I've accepted this gift. And now it belongs to me. It could be. That 
you're here this morning. You know about the gift. You've heard about the gift. But have you ever made it yours? Said, wow, Jesus, it's mine. He's for me. I accept this gift. Thank you. Amen. To make it yours, you have to accept it. For it to be yours. I want you to bow your head and I want you to close your eyes and I'm finished today. Let me ask you a question. Has there come, has there been a time in your life when you understood in your mind about this gift and you heard the story of this baby in a manger and you realized that, you know, he really did come and he, and he lived and he died for me. And He did that to pay for my sins so that I could be with God forever. <clears throat> Have you ever opened your present from Jesus? Have you ever received that gift of grace? Hey, it's paid for. It don't cost you anything. Oh, but it cost Him everything. It wasn't free. The gift of the Savior. The Messiah. Friends, it's more than just knowing about the gift. You have to make it yours. You accept it. You open it. You embrace it. Today. Perhaps this is your day. Perhaps this is your experience. The day when everything lined up in your mind. And you almost say, oh, now I get it. That's why the baby came. <laughs> and maybe today, Embrace the gift of Jesus. Say, preacher, I've heard all that. I know about all that. But I've never really unwrapped the present. I've never really made it mine. It's not yours until you accept it. I wonder. God has brought you here in this place on this day for this purpose. Maybe this is your day. Maybe you would like to speak from your heart to God and say, Father, I get it. Now I get it. I see it. That's why the baby came. Thank you for loving me this much, God. Thank you for giving me this gift. And, and God, as best I know how to do today, now, I accept it. Thank you for this gift. Jesus, the only thing I'll ever need Father, thank you for taking all of that pain, all of the shame, for taking all that from me. God, thank you. Thank you for the gift, the greatest gift ever. Thank you for forgiveness, acceptance, salvation. Lord, we really, really do love you today. And we're really thankful for the greatest gift of all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, thanks for coming today. Uh,
Hope you'll come to the party tonight at 73 Main Street, Chicago. It's just a fun time with the family. Don't miss next Sunday. If you're our guest, thanks. You honor us by being here. God bless y'all. Have a great week. Merry Christmas.